Introduction to Active Directory. Active Directory has been around for a while now, since Windows Server 2000 in fact, and I still find when I talk to people that it's still often misunderstood. So what we're going to try to achieve here in these series of videos is to cover Active Directory in such a way that no one's going to have any questions. So, are there any questions before we start? No? Great. Well, so far so good then. Actually, all humour aside though, and yes, that was my lame attempt at a joke, before we start talking about what Active Directory is and get into the configuration aspects of Active Directory, let's start with a quick look at what improvements Microsoft have made with Active Directory in Windows Server 2008. And don't worry if they sound like gibberish to you, hopefully that by the time you've watched these videos, you'll be singing the same Active Directory song as the rest of us. Well, there are four enhancements that have been made to Active Directory in Windows 2008 that are worthy of mention. Firstly, we have some welcome changes to auditing. Now, the old method of auditing access to objects inside our domain, the files and folders and so on, is all there as it once was, but now auditing Active Directory object access has been given a boost since we're now able to audit four subcategories instead of one, as we could in past versions of Windows Server. You see, in previous versions of Windows Server, we could only turn auditing on for the directory service access, but in Windows Server 2008, we can still audit access, but we can now also audit changes made to objects in the directory, and this includes objects that have been moved to a different location or undeleted. We can also audit directory replication, as well as service replication, and we're going to talk more about these features in another video. Now, another major improvement is that we can now restart Active Directory without having to restart the entire server, which is what we had to do previously if we needed to stop Active Directory from running. Now, all we have to do is to stop the domain controller service, and we can administratively take the domain controller offline, perform maintenance, and then start the service up again, so this is a welcome improvement. Now another new feature in Windows Server 2008 is the ability to create read-only domain controllers. A read-only domain controller is a special type of domain controller that's ideally suited for locations where a domain controller would ordinarily be useful, such as at the end of a slow link. Now the problem is, often at these remote sites, there might be only a few not too technical users maybe no systems administrator, and often very little security. And these sorts of locations are normally a great target for attackers that want to compromise your network, since it's often far easier to physically get to a server in a remote office than it is to get to the one at head office. So Microsoft have introduced the read-only domain controller, which for all intents and purposes looks and smells and acts like a fully functioning domain controller, except for one important distinction. It's read-only, and as such, changes that involve domain tasks can't be made to it locally. Any changes to it will have to be replicated from one of the other domain controllers, and again, we're going to have a whole video dedicated to this topic. And finally, in Windows Server 2008, Microsoft have introduced some new more granular password and account policies. For example, it's now possible to have multiple password and account lockout policies within the same domain, something that would have required special password filtering or separate domains in Windows Server 2003. All right, so Microsoft have made some changes to Active Directory and Windows Server 2008, and they're all good welcome changes, but if you're new to Active Directory, then you might have just wondered what on earth I was just talking about. So let's start from the beginning. What is Active Directory? Well, Active Directory is just a database. That's right, it's just a database, which is created when you install the domain controller role on a Windows Server operating system. This database is what stores the directory. Now, a directory is just a collection of objects that are stored inside the Active Directory database. And these objects enable Microsoft Networks to easily use and locate those objects to assist them in performing tasks. So Active Directory stores information about things such as files and folders and users and groups and printers and applications and much more inside its database. 
and it's the directory service that works with the objects inside the Active Directory database to provide a method of locating objects that you can use and manage. So for example, let's say you might have 50 printers in your network all over the country, and along comes Bob who's just joined the company and he needs to locate a printer that can print in both colour and on A3 paper. Well, there's no way Bob knows where all these printers are. Now he could ask someone else, but they probably don't know about all the printers either. And Bob probably doesn't want to print to another printer in a different state or a different company office. He just wants to find a printer that meets his requirements in the same office if there is one that he can use. Well, Bob here could use Active Directory to locate printers based on his requirements. Then, if he has the correct permission, he can connect to the printer and print his documents without having to go and ask other people for this information. Now, objects inside Active Directory have characteristics called attributes. For example, a user account could have an email address, a first name, a last name, a logon name, an address, a phone number, and other attributes, and you can use Active Directory to search for these values to find what you're looking for. Active Directory also has containers that can contain other objects. For example, a group could contain users. Now it's the Active Directory schema that defines the objects that are stored inside Active Directory. And the schema is really only just a long list of definitions that determine the types of objects that are stored and some information about those objects. These schema definitions themselves are also stored as objects inside Active Directory and they can be administered in the same way as other objects. So the schema has two different types of objects. We have schema class objects and schema attribute objects. And both of these are defined in Active Directory as separate lists within the schema. And these class and attribute objects are also known as metadata. Schema class objects describe which objects can be created in Active Directory. Each schema class is just a collection of schema attribute objects. When you create a new schema class, it's the schema attribute that stores the information that describes the objects. For example, the computer class, it's got many schema attributes, including things like description and location. But every single object in Active Directory is an instance of the schema class object. Schema attribute objects, on the other hand, define the schema class objects which they're associated with. Now, each of these schema attributes is defined only once, but it can be used in multiple schema classes. For example, the attribute location. That can be used to describe a printer or a user or a computer, but the attribute location is defined only once in Active Directory. Now, Active Directory contains a lot of schema classes and attributes, but it can be extended by defining new classes and attributes for existing classes. However, extending the schema is an advanced and dangerous operation that's generally only done by experienced developers. And some applications such as Exchange Server 2007 or ISA Server 2006 can also add their own schema classes and attributes to Active Directory. OK, so we've talked a bit about Active Directory and the fact is it's really only a database and it doesn't really need to be overcomplicated by calling it something that it's not. So let's move on and we'll take a look at how Active Directory sits inside our Windows network. So the Active Directory model is built using a logical structure. This structure uses domains, forests, trees, and OUs. Now the advantage of using a logical structure as opposed to a physical one is that users don't need to physically know where devices are in order to be able to use and locate them. It all starts with the Active Directory Forest. When you first install the Active Directory domain services role on a Windows 2008 server, it becomes the first domain controller in a new forest with the forest root given the name of the first domain that you create. So let's say that we install the Active Directory domain services role on a Windows 2008 server and we call our domain winstructor.com. Now we have a single domain controller in a domain called winstructor.com and the forest boundary 
effectively becomes this area here. We now have a single domain forest. But when we add a child domain to our existing structure, we now have what's referred to as a domain tree. Since we now have more than one domain and the child domain branches out from the parent domain, kind of like branches on a tree. So now that we've added a child domain, the forest boundary now becomes this entire area. Now we could add in more and more child domains and even child domains under other child domains. So these domains in a tree all share a contiguous namespace and a hierarchical name structure with child domain names appended to the name of the parent. So in this image here, we could see that the parent domain at the top of winstructor.com, underneath that parent domain, we have two child domains, uk.winstructor.com and us.winstructor.com. Child domains can also, of course, contain other child domains. So we can see that the child domain of uk.winstructor.com is London uk.winstructor.com. So this relationship makes uk.winstructor.com the parent of the London domain. Yet this entire structure here still forms a single domain tree. And our forest boundary is now considered to be this entire area. But the advantage of a forest is that we can now add in more domain trees and they don't even need to have the same namespace. So here we can see that we have an entire domain tree structure which starts at the parent domain called winstructor.com. Now we could add in another entire domain tree structure which has a totally different name, in this case companyx.com. And now our forest covers this entire area. So it's important to understand that in general, forests are groups of one or more separate domain trees, but you can have a single domain in a forest but most people really refer to that as just a domain, although technically the forest boundary is the same. So even though in our example here, our domain trees now forest have different namespaces from each other, and we can see that winstructor.com and companyx.com are certainly different names, but they're linked by a two-way transitive trust. So this enables each domain tree and their respective child domains to be able to communicate with each other. So for argument's sake, people in the london.uk.winstructor.com domain, given the appropriate permissions, they'll be able to access resources in the us.companyx.com domain. So now that we understand what the forest boundaries are and how forests and domain trees are structured, let's look at a smaller subset of things that we're likely to find inside our forest. Okay, next we have a domain, which is depicted by the triangle here, and that's how you'll see them referenced in many books and in Microsoft's own documentation. Active Directory uses domains to reflect your company's organization. Domains form a security boundary around the objects that they contain using access control lists or ACLs and security policies to permit or deny access to objects inside the domain. So to create a domain, we are going to need at least one domain controller or two domain controllers for redundancy in case one happens to be offline for any reason. These domain controllers keep a central list of user passwords and permissions that these users have to objects in the domain and the domain stores information only about the objects that it contains. Now within our domains, we can also create organizational units or OUs OUs are just containers that are used to organize objects into a logical group. Now an OU can contain objects like user accounts or groups, computers, printers, file shares, and OUs can also contain other OUs. OUs provide the most granular scope to which you can assign administrative authority, and they also provide a means for handling administrative tasks. So for example, here we've created an OU called corporate, where we can create and store user accounts. Now, in order to be able to structure our organization, we're able to create other OUs underneath our parent corporate OU, such as the accounting department, marketing, sales, and so on, and we can build our OU structure to mirror our company structure. Administrators can also use OUs to reflect the company organization. So using our existing hierarchy, all of our users could be managed at the head office. 
but let's say we hire a new administrator to manage the sales department. We could then assign the new administrator the ability to manage the objects inside the sales OU. This gives the new administrator the ability to do their job without allowing them access to manage objects inside the parent corporate OU. Now this sort of structure is great because it grants us a lot of flexibility. But let's say our new administrator's role changes and is now tasked with managing the entire corporate network. So rather than assigning permissions to each OU individually, we can assign permissions at the parent OU of corporate and all of the child OUs of accounting and management, marketing and sales will inherit the permissions of the parent. So using this structure, we can assign permissions only once. The next Active Directory feature we need to talk about are sites. Sites are simply a combination of one or more IP subnets that are connected by a fast, reliable link. Generally, sites share the same boundaries as your local area networks, but they're not part of the Active Directory namespace. Active Directory groups users and computers into domains and OUs, but sites only contain computers and connection objects that are used to configure replication between sites. As we can see in the diagram, sites can be isolated to a single site per domain, and this will often be the case if your company is a small company or everyone's situated at the same physical location. Domains can also be broken up into multiple sites, and this would be a typical scenario when you have a company that's spread across a geographic location, such as a head office with a smaller branch office in a separate location, such as in a different state. And we could also have a single site spread over multiple domains. Now, like we said earlier in this video, in order to have a domain, you will need at least one domain controller. Domain controllers are simply servers that store a replica of the domain directory database. They service user authentication requests and they control the domain security policy. Domain controllers can only service one domain, but you can have more than one domain controller serving the same domain. Now using multiple domain controllers does provide fault tolerance as each domain controller can act on behalf of any offline domain controllers. And when the offline domain controller is brought back up, any changes made during the time that it was offline will be replicated to it, so it'll then have a current copy of the Active Directory database. Now when users do need to locate objects that exist outside of their domain or in a different tree in the forest, they use something called the Global Catalog Service. The Global Catalog is simply a central repository of information about objects within a tree or forest. By default, the global catalog is created on the first domain controller in the first domain in the forest, although it's a role that we can move to another server if we like. The global catalog server does use multi-master replication to replicate the global catalog between global catalog servers in other domains. Now each global catalog server stores a full replica of object attributes for its own domain, but it only stores a partial replica of frequently used objects such as usernames and logon names and their permissions for the other domains. And the global catalog server also enables users to log on to a network by providing universal group membership information to domain controllers. If the global catalog is not available, then the user will only be able to log on locally unless the site has been configured to cache universal group membership lookups. Okay, so we've run through a brief introduction to Active Directory and the components that make up Active Directory. This knowledge will serve as a foundation for the information that we'll discuss in the other videos in this series, where we'll cover each of these components in greater detail, and it's our goal that by the end of these Active Directory videos, you'll not only have the information you need to pass any Microsoft exam on Active Directory, but you'll know, and I mean, you'll really know what Active Directory is all about and how you can design and configure your own network. So we 